All right, good morning, everyone. Let us go ahead and begin with prayer that we might take advantage of the time the Lord's given us. Fathers, we come before you again this day. We are grateful to call upon your name. We are grateful this day by your grace to confess you as the Lord, our God, in whom is all our hope and our help. Thank you today for your mighty strength, your lordship, your sovereignty, your rule over all the, all the world and all creation. Thank you, O oh God, that your throne is steadfast and stable and none can take you from it. We rejoice this day in your rule over all. We rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. We thank you for his uh, keeping his people. Thank you for his calling us this day to worship. And as we come now, Lord, to the study of your word, as we continue to seek to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Christ, we ask your blessing upon our Sunday school class. We ask that you would open our hearts and teach us the good things of our God, that we may be more molded and shaped after the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask it in his holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, handouts in the back if you need it. We're going to finish up this morning on spiritual pride, the third lesson on this topic before. With the Lord's help, we'll get in next week to talk about, uh, to begin to speak on humility and the other side of this, obviously. You see in the top of your handout there, we we had a total of six uh, descriptions, I should say, or six evidences that Thomas Charles in, his, in the book that was edited uh, from his writings called Spiritual Counsel, uh, six evidences of pride in man, and particularly not just pride in the unbeliever. We might say that's easy to spot, uh, but what's not so easy to spot is the pride in us. Uh, it's always easy to spot in anyone else. Uh, but it's hard to spot in ourselves, it's hard to spot in God's people, uh, because we are think it's good to rejoice in a good thing. It's good to, to, uh, to talk about a good thing, and yet, as is pointed out this morning, how difficult is it to talk about a good thing without taking pride in it. Um, and so we need to be reminded this morning more narrowly and closely to our own hearts as Christians, uh, maybe, we need to be reminded in these last two evidences that pride is uh, living and abiding in all of us. We all struggle with it. There is none of us that doesn't struggle with pride. And so may the Lord open our hearts to examine ourselves this morning. We looked at four evidences last week, and this morning then we begin with Roman numeral five on your notes. A further evidence of this problem and our great need for God's grace, His forgiveness and His sanctifying grace. The question before us as we open this topic is, are we not acting in pride when we address ourselves to our work, when we face difficulties, and we encounter temptations all in our own strength? And of course, we don't really need to say any more. We all know what this is like. We all know what it's like to plow ahead, rush ahead, run ahead, and not even stop to think about praying, asking for the Lord's help. And so he says, even the best of us go about our day's duties. We face our trials, we wrestle with temptation without a cry for help to the throne of grace, strength, and mercy. Why do we do this? Unless we think to ourselves, even subconsciously, maybe not being aware of it, but we think to ourselves, I got this, right? I don't need to stop and ask because we've forgotten that we live and move and have our being in God and that without Christ we can do nothing. We all know how easy it is. The Bible doesn't command, it's not a law that we need to do morning devotions. But we all know that if we don't take time in the morning to be alone with God, we won't even think about it before the afternoon. We get up, the alarm goes off, we shower, we, maybe we exercise, whatever we might do with our morning routine. Before you know it, we're rushing out the door to that appointment. We're rushing to punch in at work. We're rushing to this obligation, that obligation. And then we go from one thing to the next. We all know how busy life is. We go from one thing to the next. And then sometime in the afternoon, maybe when we're driving down the road, mindlessly, aimlessly, we stop to think, I haven't even prayed today. I didn't read my Bible this morning, right? And maybe then we stop with a moment of conviction and ask for God's forgiveness. Or maybe we just pass that thought on and just keep driving on to the next obligation, to the next commitment, whatever it may be. And so while that's not a command that we do morning devotions, we know that if we don't take time out to be with God and to seek his help, the default is just to run through every day as if 
Well, as if we have sufficiency, right? The two things we're talking about, as if we have sufficiency and fullness in ourselves. We don't mean to behave that way. It's just how things go, as, as it were. It's how life is, and it's what we're prone to. It's what's natural, just to get up and go and run. And we know how hard it is when we think, oh, I should take time out in the morning. You know what that means? Well, it means I need to set my alarm back. Because as it is, my alarm goes off with just enough time for what I have to do, my morning routine, for what I have to do, that if I'm going to take time out for God, I'm going to have to pull the alarm back. And so we try that for a few days, but then we realize that there's another problem. Now I need to go to bed earlier. <laughs> So then that encroaches not just upon this day, but now we're encroaching upon the day before this day in order to make time on this day for what we really, really need to do, and that is to be with the Lord. And so we have to actually carve out this time. We have to take time. But when we don't, right, maybe subconsciously, uh, we're thinking in some respects, we've got this, right? We forget that we live and move and have our being in God, and we forget what Christ says, without me you can do nothing. Now, we know that. We know John 15, 5. We can all quote the verse. We know the vine and the branches and etc. But we seem to say to ourselves, I know that theologically, but, but, but not nothing, right? Not nothing, right? Surely I can do some things, many things, or at least this thing by myself. Or at best, maybe it's just simply forgetfulness. Right? Maybe we just forget. But the question we need to back up with again is, if it's just forgetfulness, we forget to read, we forget to pray, we forget to, to tap in, as it were, to the very source of strength and life for every day, then maybe it's because we don't really know ourselves. Right? We don't know how weak we are, insufficient we are, how empty we are without God. We don't realize that we're not living every day without God on the sufficiency and the fullness that's in ourselves. We're actually living every day upon the mercies of God that we haven't crashed and burned. Right? And that's often, of course, what the Lord does. In His mercy, He permits us to struggle or fail so that we become sensible of our own weakness and we at last finally cry out and say, Lord, what have I been doing? Right? What was I thinking that I could tackle this by myself, that I could go on by myself, and the Lord brings us to the place to where we crash and burn, and we finally come back home to the Lord again. And with some measure of resolution, we put the alarm back, right? And we get up in time to be with the Lord. We restart that daily devotion routine. We go back to the Bible reading or Valley of Vision or whatever it is that we might take up in the morning to stir our thoughts and our hearts to seek the Lord. But we have to realize, where is this coming from? And this is what Charles is saying, right? Where, where is this coming from? If we, if we get to the bottom of it, it's pride, right? Subconsciously or consciously, it's, it's pride defined in this way that's so helpful that there's, a, there's the thought of having sufficiency and fullness in ourselves because that's what pride does. That's what pride, how pride you know, showed itself in the fall, right? You don't need God to decide for you between good and evil. This was Satan's temptation, right? God's actually hiding something. He's actually hiding good from you behind that evil. What he says is evil is actually really good, better, right, than you can imagine because it's going to now make you like God. It'll actually exalt you to be on station with God and not under God as a creature, dependent, right? You can actually be independent of not just God, but his rules, his fences, his parameters. You can decide for yourself what is good and what is evil and that's what pride does pride then moves forward and says i don't need an outside source for knowledge i don't need an outside source for decision making i don't need an outside source or resource for fullness and sufficiency i can find all this in myself that's what pride does we're reminded then number one whatever good we've done in life we've done it all by the strength and the abilities that God gave us, and by the blessing of his mercy, which was pleased to establish it. Turn to Psalm 90, and then we'll turn to Proverbs 16. Psalm 90, verse 17. <clears throat> the psalmist ends this chapter... Verse 17, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us 
and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What an important prayer to remember. What an important realization to keep in mind that it is God who gives us any measure of success. It's God who blesses the work of our hands, right? It's God who gives us and grants us success and favor. This is why this prayer begins in verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom, right? You see what the psalmist is praying for? Give me, Lord, a right perspective on my life. Not just its brevity, but as we've been talking about, its insufficiency and its emptiness, right? This is the proper measure of my own life that I don't have in myself what I need, that I can't go to myself, I can't lean upon myself. I can, and we do, but we find a facade, we find a mirage, we find it's vanity after all, right? We find that there is nothing there that we looked for. It is God who establishes. So when we look back, and we can all look back as God's people, by God's grace, we can all look back and say, this was done well, that was done well, this effort was successful, that work turned out just great. But why? Not because we've done a great job, not because we can take credit, but rather because the Lord has been gracious, the Lord has been good. God has established the work of our hands. Turn to Proverbs 16, verse 3. We are reminded here, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Right? Here is a wise saying, as we looked at last Lord's Day in the evening. Here is a wise saying, here is a proverb, here is a principle given to God's people. This is what it means to live the life of faith, right? How do we live wise lives? We live wise lives when we live them in alignment with God's revelation. And God's revelation, just take from what we said in Psalm 90 verse 17, God's revelation makes very clear that if you want to be established, you must commit your work to the Lord. The only way to have anything established, anything done well, you remember what Jesus says, I have, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. John 15, 16, that you might bear fruit and that your fruit might abide, right? Your fruit might glorify my Father in heaven. But I chose you to bear fruit that abides, fruit that is established, fruit that is set and itself fruitful. Again, how's that all going to come about? It's going to come about by the grace and the mercy of God, by the blessing of God. And that's where we need to then lean. So if we continue here, if we resisted the devil if we've overcome the world, if we've subdued the flesh, if we've been a blessing to our brother, or if we've strengthened our sister, it was all the fruit of our living and moving and having our being in God alone. Any good we've done in our lives and in the church to one another, any blessing we have been, is because God was pleased to take us up as an instrument. Think of what he says of Assyria, right? And it's great invasion of the world ultimately coming down to invade and besiege and take into exile Israel, right? What does God say of Assyria? They're the rod of my anger, right? And you remember the Lord's rebuke to the king of Assyria, right? By my great strength I have done this. By my great strength I have conquered. By my great strength. You remember what the Rabshakeh said to Hezekiah and to his, and to, and, and to his uh, you know, the men that he sent to, to speak to the Rabshakeh? What does he say, right? Who can stand up to the king of Assyria? No one has been able. He is called the great king, the king of Assyria. And he was great, great in all the world, right? But it was because of his great pride, you remember, that the Lord said, have I not done this? Have I not determined this from long ago? Was it not I who gave you victory, right? Right? It's like, you know, can the, can, can the axe boast against the, hand, against the hand that wields it? Can't cut down a tree without an axe, right? Axe is a mighty tool, but unless someone actually takes up the axe, the axe is useless. It can't do even that. And that's all it's meant to do, but it can't do even that. So think of that relative to ourselves, right? All we are meant to do is glorify God and enjoy Him forever, but we can't even do that unless God takes us up as an instrument in His hand and uses us. Because we're fallen, we're sinful, we're proud, right? Leave us to ourselves, and we will boast against God. Leave us to ourselves, we will repeat our father's mistake, and we will arrogantly rise up against God, and we will say like, the, like Pharaoh, who is the Lord, that I should obey him. We will say like the king of Assyria, I did this. This is all the work of my hands. When it's not, and we need to remember that. Number two, we can't command even one motion of any single part of the body, or breath, or pulse. 
but we must give thanks to God for it all, right? The amazing, we all know how amazing, and we're continuing to learn as science and, and medical industry continues to study how amazing the human body is, how amazing just the eye is, the ear is. It's phenomenal what God has done in making man. It's beautiful, it's glorious, but it is God who sustains it all. Even our heart doesn't work on its own. It is God that continues the pulse and the beat and the breath of a human being. It is God who does that. Furthermore, think of this spiritually. Nor can we think one good thought. Nor can we entertain one good affection or one good desire toward God except what we receive every minute from Him because in Him we live and move and have our being both temporally and spiritually. Right? Remember what Paul says in Romans 7 as he's digging more deeply into his heart. What does he come to at last? This I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. There's nothing, right? There's nothing that is good in us. Every good is from God, and we are dependent upon him for it all, right? Turn to Isaiah 37, and let's hear what the Lord says with regard to the king of Assyria. Because it is so illustrative, so revealing of the arrogance of natural man, the arrogance of all of our hearts. And God's very clear response to it. Verse 21 of Isaiah 37. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom now, speaking to the king of Assyria, whom have you mocked and reviled? Not Hezekiah, not Israel. Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? against the Holy One of Israel. And you remember, this is how Hezekiah prayed, right? When he came and he laid the letter before the Lord. Lord, have you heard the mocks of this man, right? You've heard what he has said against you. That's exactly how the Lord responds. You have lifted up your eyes to the heights against me. By your servants you have mocked the Lord. And you have said, with my many chariots, I have gone up to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon, to cut down its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses, to come to its remotest heights, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank waters to dry up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Right? Speaking of the vast dominion that the king of Assyria has taken up in his conquering one after another. And then the Lord says in verse 26, Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? And when I read that, I think immediately of what he said to do in Deuteronomy through Moses, right? You go after other gods, right? I'll blight your fields, I'll harden the heavens, I'll harden the earth, etc., and then ultimately exile. The Lord says, I determined this long ago. I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins. I did that. I gave you victory over the nations. Verse 28 I know you're sitting down and you're going out and coming in and you're raging against me because you have rage against me and your complacency has come to my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will turn you back by the, on the way by which you came. And of course, he returns home and his own sons kill him. Right. The Lord has a day, Isaiah 2 says. The Lord has a day against everything that is haughty and proud and lifted up, and he will bring it down so that none will be exalted on that day but the Lord. God despises the proud. And so we know this, right? We know that without Christ we can do nothing. We know that we live and move and have our being in him. But secondly, in whose heart does this practical belief actually abide? Right? Who of us is practically perpetually, daily, impressed and influenced by this reality. Our utter dependence 
on God. How conscious are we that without God's help and continued influence, even the best of us have no wisdom for our work, no strength for our duty, no success for our trials, and no victory for our battles? Do we not often simply run into the battle, fight our temptations, and put our hands to the plow of our duty without a prayer or thought of asking for the Lord's help and blessing? Again, it's convicting, but we have to just think about that, right? We have to examine this for ourselves, right? And to recognize before the Lord and our own conscience, how often do we not pray? Right? How often do we rush forward without seeking the Lord's help? How often do we just take a matter up without being conscious of utter dependence? Need, our need for the Lord, right? And again, it's not that... You know, if, if on the one hand it, it's sim- simple, simply forgetfulness, but why is that? Why are we so forgetful of our dependence? But because we don't really know ourselves as well as we should. That so we haven't come to learn of our dependence, which as Thomas Charles continues to reiterate, at the end of the day, whatever the Lord does with us, this is what he's doing, right? Whatever trial, whatever affliction, whatever disappointment, frustration, sadness, this is what he's doing to take you off of yourself, off of dependence upon yourself and to bring you back to a full dependence upon him because this brings him glory but guess what fully depending upon God is a tapping into the infinite resources of the infinite God now you have everything you need it's right there but there's only one way to bring you there and that is of course to humble you because pride will oppose it furthermore and if by God's mercy we prove successful in our work we prove successful in, successful in the face of temptation or trial or difficulty. If we never ask the Lord for help going into it, how often do we stop to give God praise and thanks after we come out of it? Right? So we're guilty on both sides. Not only do we rush ahead without praying and asking for help because we have a sense of independence, but when we get to the other side of it, then how often do we and what would be the basis to say, Lord, thank you? How easy then is it to be puffed up even more now by our pride? Because we look back and say, well, I actually did do that on my own. I actually did do that by myself. I actually did do that independently. Although, of course, we never did. But that's what pride does. How often does unprayed for success result in sacrificing to our own net? Turn to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1. <clears throat> Remember, this was Habakkuk's cry to the Lord, right? That God would, you know, his, his struggle before the Lord, his complaint as it's listed in our, in our Bibles, his complaint to the Lord was, you know, I realize your people are sinful, but how can you raise up and take up as a rod in your hand an even more sinful nation, Babylon, to bring against your people Judah? How is that right for a holy God to do that? But part of his struggle here, look at verses 12 to 17, part of his struggle is not only am I struggling with the fact that you would use a more wicked nation right, against your people for their wickedness, but by using them, they're just going to boast in it as if they did it by themselves. Right? They're going to sacrifice to their own net. Look at verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Of course, part of the problem is Babylon, right? Our our Judah wasn't more righteous than Babylon. Judah's more guilty. Because the greater light we've received, the greater when we sin, the greater our sin when we sin against it, right? So Judah is more guilty. Verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He, this is the king of Babylon, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net, he gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? 
Habakkuk is very understanding here that God opposes the proud. How then can God let the king of Babylon grow even more proud by giving him the victory over Judah, using them to, as a reproof against his own people? The Lord hates pride, but we have to again bring this home to ourselves. This isn't about the king of Babylon. This is about us, right? How often does unprayed for success result in our sacrificing to our own net? Chris. Yeah, this is a great point. You know, even even to new even to further nuance this, <clears throat> what if we do pray for it? How often do we not thank him after that success? Right, we fell on that side well, too. Well, I did it. I did yep. it through my prayer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Did not thank God for that success. You prayed for the success, you right. prayed for whatever. Right. And thanks to my dear wife, and she's right there ready to say, Let's thank God for this right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's so many ways we can fall short of this, right? So many ways we can fall short of this, even when we pray, and yet we don't give thanks to God for it. But as I said already, number two there, (coughs) but in the Lord's kindness, He often permits us to struggle or fail so that we become sensible of our weakness and cry to Him for strength and blessing. So Charles puts it this way, God is determined in everything to bring man out of himself Therefore, so far as we depend on ourselves, so far are we sure to be disappointed. Right? So far as we depend upon ourselves, so far are we sure to be disappointed. Furthermore, look at letter C. It's our pride and self-sufficiency and not our weakness which gives any inward or outward enemy the victory over us. Right? Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. Remember Paul's words about the thorn in the flesh. And the revelation that the Lord gave him in that moment of season of trial. Paul felt beset by his great weakness, only to discover by the Lord's grace that his weakness was not his problem. Right? Right? The temptation toward pride and self-sufficiency was the problem. And so verses 9 and 10, right? we read here, Paul says, uh, my, but he said to me, right, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Right? You're better when you're weak. And again, this is what we said earlier. The problem, if it's forgetfulness, then behind that is this, you know, this issue of not really knowing ourselves. But if we come to know ourselves and we, we become more aware and fully aware by God's grace of our own weakness, that's the best place to be. Because that's where the Lord's strength, that's where the Lord's strength thrives. Because we have that, we come to our work and to temptations and to trials with an utter dependency. Because we know we have nothing. So Paul says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. So that the glory or the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a great reminder, what a tremendous help. We are more than conquerors, says Paul in Romans 8, through him who loved us, right? This is how we conquer, not in our own strength, right? God gives effectual grace in every time of need in proportion to our humility. God gives grace sufficient in every time of need. God gives grace in proportion to our humility. Matthew 9, 29, be it done unto you according to your faith. And what is humility but just born out of faith? So we could say, be it done unto you according to your humility. Because remember in James, right? James 4. God blesses the humble, right? God blesses the humble, but he opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. All the grace they need. This is why Jesus says, come and ask, right? I'm on the throne of grace. I who died for you, I who love you, I'm on the throne of grace. Come to me in the hour of need and you'll find grace and mercy. Sufficient. But that requires humility. We can't come to the throne of grace proudly. We will be turned away, right? He turns the proud away, right, said Mary. He turns the proud away. And the Lord will not welcome us in pride, and he will not bless our pride. So if we look to God for strength, if we look to God for help and deliverance in every trial, we'll find that his grace will be sufficient for us. But if we forsake him and we confidently rely upon ourselves, it will be no wonder if, like Peter, we fall and find out just how weak we are without God. So turn to Luke 22. 
and remember Peter's fall. Well, remember, first of all, his pride. So Luke 22, verse 33 and 34 I'll begin in 31. The Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And then toward the end of the chapter 62, what do we find? Peter's failure. His denial of the Lord three times, and then he went out and wept bitterly. Right? What did the Lord do for Peter? He brought him to know himself. Right? He brought him to see himself. The reason we find no help in those kinds of situations is twofold. First of all, we didn't ask God for help. Because that's the only place help is. It doesn't exist outside of God. So first of all, we didn't ask God for help. But secondly, because we didn't ask God for help, we reach inside for strength, for sufficiency and fullness. And we look for something in ourselves that we're sure is there. And what do we find when we go there? Nothing. It's empty. It's vanity, right? It's a chasing after the wind. Emptiness and vanity, insufficiency and nothingness. Turn to Jeremiah 17 and remember what the Lord says. In fact, the curse God pronounces upon man who looks within as a resource for himself. Proud sinner. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. So there's the curse. The curse that God has placed upon the proud sinner who looks for him to himself for resource. Contrary, look at the blessing in 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Notice Yahweh, whose trust is Yahweh. He is like a tree planted by water, Psalm 1, that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes because its leaves remain green. And he's not anxious in the year of drought even, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Why? Because his help is in the Lord who made heaven and earth. His strength is in God, right? And notice the drought comes on him too, right? The king of Assyria comes to him too. Trouble comes to him too. But what does he do? You have two options, right? This is what Charles is bringing up. There's two options in every situation. You can either look to self or look to God. Naturally, arrogantly, we want to look to self. And when we do, we find nothing. Or in the mercy of God, we think we found something because our work is established. We just grow more proud and we sacrifice to our own net. And so everything God is doing is to bring us off ourselves, out of ourselves, as he puts it, that we might rely upon God. Think again of Peter. When Peter was humbled, he could say, Lord, is it I? One of you will betray me. Right? Lord, is it I? But when he was proud, he said, Lord, not I. They may forsake you. All the others may leave you, but I am ready to go to death with you. William Grinnell, in his famous Christian in Complete Armor, says spiritual pride and self-confidence will show itself by the neglect of those means through the use of which the grace and comforts of the saints are sustained. Right? And again, just think of prayer. Right? Spiritual pride and self-confidence will show itself when we neglect prayer, which is the very means to sustain us, the very grace and comfort to sustain and help us. We neglect the very thing that is our dependence or a means to dependence because our dependence is really in God, of course, but we, ne we neglect the means to our fullness and sufficiency. Why would we do that? Because that's the only, as I said earlier, that's the only place help is. That's where we've been getting help from the, all the while. Why would we suddenly leave that? We grow forgetful, which is exactly what Moses warned Israel. Be careful when you come into the land. Right? Wells, houses, orchards, vineyards, lest you forget your God. 
who gave you all of that. And that's why he reminded them and reiterated to the second generation several times in the early chapters of Deuteronomy. It's not because of you that you're being brought into the land. It's not because you're any better than the ones being kicked out of the land. It's because of their great sinfulness that God is driving them out of the land. And if you do what they did, you too will be driven out of the land, which is exactly what happened. Warning upon warning upon warning upon warning. How then could Israel go the way they went? Pride, right? The pride and the arrogance that we see in the analogy made between Israel and Gomer, even in Hosea chapter 2. So God is determined... Number four, top of the page there, God is determined that we will live to him and upon him, right? For his glory and utterly dependent upon him. And since that's the sure way to secure God all all the glory, then it's the only way to secure for ourselves all comfort, all peace, and all help. Again, just go to Isaiah 2 and 3 and see and be reminded, right? The Lord has a day against all that is proud. He alone will be exalted in that day. And he will not allow man to stand next to him and say, me too. I did this, right? I did this without you. God won't allow it. Not a single, single one. And so the Lord will always oppose pride. And he will oppose it most of all in his own people, right? Which is exactly what Habakkuk comes to understand, right? Right? How can you abide his pride, the king of Babylon? The Lord can't abide his pride, right? The Lord destroyed Babylon for their arrogance. But before not abiding that, he can't abide it in his own people who are called by his name, who are to reflect him in this world, who are to be a witness to the nations, who are to be a light upon a hill. My servant Israel, that's where he cannot abide it most of all, is in the church. Right? The day is coming when the proud of the world will be brought down, but the day is now. Remember what Peter said, First Peter 4, right? Judgment begins at the household of God. This is where God can't abide it, most of all, any sin. All right, secondly this morning, have we not, and this is the last item, the last evidence that he brings, have we not acted in pride when we take and keep to ourselves the praise and the glory due to God alone? And this is just a furtherance of the previous point, of course. And one thing to point out here is the Apostle Paul, right? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and remember Paul's Humility. And what's so helpful about what Paul says here is Paul is compelled to recognize his own fruitfulness. Paul is compelled to recognize his good works right? because he's making a comparison that's helpful in this context, in fact, necessary when he is being so opposed by the Corinthians, which church, by the grace of God, he planted, right? He preached to, he labored with. And so Paul is compelled to stand upon his own work. But he cannot even bring that up without giving glory to God, all glory to God. And so Paul says in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 15, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see the sandwich, right? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I did more than all, yet it was not I but the grace of God. right? So he's compelled to mention his own work, compelled to say, I, did, I planted the church, I founded you, I brought the gospel to you, I laid the foundation. As he says earlier in chapter 3, no one can lay any other foundation than what I laid. And yet not I, but God's grace. right? So you see Paul's humility. What a wonderful... And helpful example. Paul knew himself. Think of the two things we've been talking about here through this whole essay from Charles. Paul knew himself on the one hand to be a creature. And that made him humble. But secondly, he knew himself to be a sinner and that made him contrite. Because what we're striving for here, what we're after, what God, what, what God is pleased with is humility and contrition. The humility of a creature, the contrition of a sinner. And so we might say what we need to do then, of course, is know ourselves. What am I? I'm a creature and I'm a sinner. That keeps me humble and this keeps me contrite. God is pleased with that lowly contrite spirit in Isaiah 57, 15. With that one, he who inhabits eternity and fills the heaven of the heavens, with that one, God says, he will dwell. 
Now, sadly, number letter B, sadly, we sometimes disguise the most diabolical pride by a show of humility. Many think themselves most humble when, in truth, they're filled with the glory of their own humility and exalted to heaven with the high opinion of their own self-abasement. Charles puts it this way, their humility is swelling, self-conceited, confident, and assuming without one spark of gratitude to God or any disposition to give him the glory for their humility. So what are we boasting in then? We're boasting in humility. I'm so humble. It's terrible, right? And so we find here the deceitfulness of the heart and the subtlety of Satan appearing nowhere so great as in the workings of the sin of pride, which means this is where we need to be most watchful. Again, Jeremiah 17, cursed is the man who makes the flesh his strength. And Psalm 139, think, think, of, think of David's prayer in Psalm 139. Lord, search my heart, try me, know me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, you know my heart. I need your help. I can't see what's there. And if I look, I'm prone to be proud of any good I find and I'm prone to justify any bad I find. So I need you, right? God who, who is of two pure eyes to look upon evil, the God who is holy, and who in, in whom alone we can boast, and we need him to look in our hearts. So every occasion, the reason we need to be on watch for pride is pride surprises us and appears when we least expect it. Every occasion is suitable for pride. Think about that. Every occasion is suitable for pride. Think of the two sides here. He says, when we're talking about the good things we've done, pride will appear to boast in our goodness. And when we're bemoaning our sins... Pride will appear to boast in our grief over those sins or in our being at least some better than others. Right? Every occasion is suitable for pride. Pride can boast in your goodness. Pride can boast in your badness. It finds a way. Right? It will feed. Look at number one. I think I mentioned this last week. Pride will feed on the ashes of other sins and pride will gain strength by the exercise of real grace and true humility. We're in danger of worshiping ourselves as saints when we've denied ourselves as sinners. So apt are we to forget ourselves and overlook our unworthiness though the, through the enjoyment of distinguishing blessings. So what we need to do is, right, we need to, this is where we, we realize then we need to be in this constant humility, right? This is the road we need to walk on, right? We need to keep in the way of humility. And the whole point of the thorn on the flesh, the thorn in the flesh, remember Apostle Paul was because he was tempted to pride. <laughs> because no man had seen what he saw in the third heavens. No man had heard what he heard. I can't even tell you, he said. Right? And Paul's temptation to pride was the very reason God brought the thorn in the flesh. And God graciously kept Paul under so that he rejoiced in his weakness. So look at number three. Think back to what we read about Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 in the church of Corinth. Reflecting on our former experiences... Without the grace of those experiences still at work in us is what pride loves to be engaged in. And it's often the beginning of our ruin and the first step to our downfall. So if we're humbled, if we were humbled by the Lord's kindness to us, the Lord's blessings, then we need to be sure that we never speak of it without the same humility. Again, 1 Corinthians 15. Right? If we're going to look back, right? if we're going to look back at, again, like Chris was saying earlier, right? we look back, at how the Lord answered our prayer for help, we need to give God the praise and the thanks for answering our prayer. If we're going to look back in another respect and see the good the Lord enabled us to do, right? even then if we exercise humility in the doing of it, we need to not look back to it without that same humility. right? We need to look back to it with the same grace still at work in us so that we can never speak of it but by the same humility, which is exactly what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15. Yes, I did some amazing things. In fact, I did more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God which is in me. So whether they preached or I preached, so you have believed, as he goes on, your hope is in God and not in me. Remember what Paul said to the church in Corinth again, 1 Corinthians 2, right? When I was among you, I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Lest you think that your confidence rests in my eloquence, that your confidence rests in my wisdom, in my strength, in my stature, in anything about me. So it was in order to put you off of me and put you entirely upon God and your hope might be in God. 
that I never boasted in those things, never sought to glory in those things. Remember Philippians 3? If you think you have reason to glory, I have more, says Paul. But I forsake it all. I deny it all. I trash it all. And I make one thing my boast, the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my boast. That's what I rejoice. That's what I sing about. That's what I meditate upon. That's what I thank God for and not myself. So let us beware then of talking about ourselves <clears throat> or our works without the humility of a creature and the contrition of a sinner. Let us beware of giving God glory only in our words. Because remember, man can't see the heart, but God does. Man can't see what's behind your words, but God does. Man can't see why you're saying something, but God does. So be sure never to talk about yourself without being fully aware that you're under the blessed influence of the grace of humility that can be honest about the imperfections in your work and that the blessing of God is alone what established it and not you. So it's not just, you see, it's not just doing things in a spirit of humility. Here Charles makes a warning. Don't even talk about it afterwards without the same spirit of humility. Because if you didn't take pride in the doing of it, praise God. But you can still take pride after doing it. Right? You think of, you know, think of these two things together, right? For bring these two things together, that's what number five and number six are. Number five is saying, how many times do you rush ahead with this period of independence? It's pride, and you're doing it proudly. You need to do whatever you do humbly. But number six is saying, okay, now we've gotten through that, but guess what? There's another area that pride's going to rear its ugly head, and that's after you've done it, and you're all done, and all you're doing now is talking about it. Right? And someone says to you, good job. That was amazing, wonderful. What do you do then? How often do we say, yes, I know. I worked really hard on that, right? It's a small thing, but what are we doing? We're like, we're taking pride in it rather than saying, even then, right? Don't do it without humility. Don't talk about it afterwards without humility. And if we can't talk about it with humility, then we shouldn't talk about it. Right? And if we pick up at this uh, last note here, right? What does it take? What does it take to talk about it humbly afterwards? It takes the same thing that it took to do it humbly in the beginning, to know yourself, to remember afterwards you're nothing but a creature in whom there is no good thing, and you're nothing but a sinner who should be in dust and ashes in repentance before God every single day, because even your best works are tainted and stained with sin. You'll never be able to do anything that won't bear the mark and the stamp of having been done by a sinner. Praise God, it will also bear the mark of having been done by a sinner saved by grace. So that the, you know, the, the tincture, if you will, as Thomas Boston calls it, the tincture of the Holy Spirit will always be with it, and it will always, always be pleasing to God, because it's done by a child of God. But take that away and look at it as it is in itself. It will always bear the mark of having been done by a sinner. So we need to keep that in mind, the same thing we had to keep in mind beforehand. We need to keep that in mind afterwards so that we don't ever even talk about anything well that we did without keeping before us the humility of a creature and the contrition of a sinner. Let me just close with a couple of quotes here under D. Number two, Charles says, to bring us to live upon him as his creatures, and to be willing to be saved by him as sinners are things that are indispensable. And we no further, we are no further living to God or are saved than we are thus truly humbled. Right? And that's just straight from Scripture, right? We are no further living to God, and we are no more saved than we are humble. So what is the essential mark of a Christian? Humility. Remember, this is why Augustine said when he was asked, what are, the, what are the three key Christian virtues? Humility, humility, humility. Without this, you're not a Christian. You're not. Because you're either, let's face it, right? What have we been seeing in Hosea and the Sunday night study and even here? What, you're either proud or humble, right? The scales are tipped either one way or the other. We're always going to deal with pride. That's what we're learning here, even as Christians. 
but by God's grace that is being mortified in us. So, number three, accordingly, every dispensation of God toward us, both of his providence and his grace, has an immediate and direct tendency to bring man in every view out of himself and to lay him in the dust. When we're determined to have our own way, God has a thousand ways to make us know ourselves and to convince us that he is God so that we can live with so that we can effectively learn to live entirely upon his all-sufficiency as our creator and to be saved entirely by his Son as our Savior. I know I've spoken to you about this before. I believe this is the greatest book on humility ever written. Highly recommend it. It's not something you read straight through. You pick away at it bit by bit by bit. Private Thoughts on Religion by Thomas Adam, um, later Puritan, uh, 1701, 1784, kind of during the era of Matthew Henry, Um, not to be confused with the earlier Puritan, Thomas Adams. This is Thomas Adam, Um, and of course, standing in the vein of Puritanism. This is a uh, printed by International Outreach. Um, They do a lot of old Puritan stuff, kind of pricey. Uh, It's just the nature of a small publisher, but... uh, It, in fact, says on the back, one of the most humbling books you will ever read. And you remember I shared with you about Thomas Adam before. He was in ministry uh, for decades before he realized that he wasn't a believer, Um, pastoring a church, and then through preaching through Romans, came to be convicted, struggling with conscience issues for a long time, and then came to salvation. Um, And what this is is a book of, it's really just uh, entries, right, taken from, his writings, his journals, his diaries, stuff he never intended to be published. Um, and uh, it's just little entries. And they've, they've been categorized by the editor under you know certain chapters and topics. Chapter 5, Repentance. And there's about a dozen or so chapters in here. It's stuff he never intended to be printed, uh, but it carries such help um, and such heart-searching introspection uh, that uh, it has been a blessing, been a great blessing to me for a long time. And then on the back here on the cover, he has excerpts from, uh, from what's inside. And I'll just read you a couple of these entries. Adam says, the character of man is proud sinner. It's one of his entries. This is the character of man, proud sinner. Despair is the growth of pride and not of humility. It would be great self-ignorance and presumption in me to say, I will not sin today. I am hateful and contemptible, and yet I cannot help idolizing that painted thing which I myself am. Isn't that ridiculous, right? You see the struggle. I'm hateful and contemptible, and yet I idolize myself. What is that? Pride. What do I ask of God? Happiness confusedly? or himself as the only ground of it. What should I be if I had talents to be proud of when I am so proud of nothing? How bad would I be if God gave me gifts to be proud of when I am so proud of nothing? Christ in me will be the same God-devoted, sin-hating, soul-loving, self-denying, self-denying, suffering, laboring Christ that he is in himself. In other words, Christ will not abide any pride in his people. Much forgiven and little love. How is that? It's these sorts of entries. One, two, three sentences, whatever it may be. Some longer paragraphs. So, 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 so helpful. Um, Just daily food for the soul to cast you every day right in the dust and to remind you you have every reason in the world and more than you'll ever realize to be humble as a creature and contrite as a sinner because we're nothing. And God gets all the glory. Amen. Let's pray.